Okay, so we're going to configure an intrusion detection system. So in this activity, we're going to use an IDS sensor to monitor different packets. Okay, and then with intrusion detection systems, they're different from intrusion prevention systems because with IPS, you're actually preventing some sort of action. You can shut down a system or isolate a system. Uh, but with an IDS, you're just monitoring traffic and generating alerts. All right, we're going to use Security Onion, which is a Linux system. It's open source. And security, if you learn Security Onion, you're going to have a good foundation for learning a lot of different IDS. So it's a really good one to start with, I think. And it's also open source. So if you get to an organization that doesn't have an IDS, which there are lots of them, uh, you, can, you can incorporate Security Onion and you'll know how to do it. Okay. Uh, and Security Onion also includes Snort, which is a really useful, um, I mean, Snort is the IDS that we're using here, okay? So, let's see, the IDS sensor has already been configured for you. The Ethernet 1 interface on RT Local is configured as the source port for monitor, and then Ethernet 1 interface on SEM1 is also connected to the VISP switch. It's the destination port. This interface has no IP address. It's used for monitoring sensor only. So let's take a look at this network diagram. Okay, this is... Let me adjust this so you can see everything. Okay. So here's our Ethernet 1 sensor. Off of RT1, which is what it's referring to here. All right, RT1 local is configured as a source port for monitoring. Okay, so RT1 is the source port, then the sensor is put down here to the management interface. All right, and then we have a couple different machines here. We have a local switch. All right, it's pretty kind of a confusing network diagram. There's a lot of extra stuff here that we don't really need to pay attention to. But just know that what they're referring to here, RT local, Ethernet 1 with the sensor coming out of it. So that's this diagram here. Okay. And then SEM1's F0 interface is connected to the V local switch. Yeah, we see that. Uh, F0 is connected to V local. Yep. This interface does not have an IP address. It can be used to manage the appliance from the local network. Yeah, so we're going to use that to manage this. All right, and then this is the lab topology and PT1 Kali. The Kali VM is located on a remote network, which is representing the internet. So basically the Kali machine is gonna represent any external traffic or malicious activity. All right, and then uh, packets directed at the virtual machines on the local VLAN are routed to RT3, RT2, RT3 and RT2, and RT1 local. Okay, so any packets are routed. Um, okay, so the, here's the Linux, here's the Kali Linux. These are going to be routed to RT3, or they could be routed to RT2 and then the local. Got it. Any questions on all that? I know it's a little confusing. You don't need to understand that to do the lab. And <laughs> sometimes the people who write these labs, you know, they, these are very uh, knowledgeable individuals who are writing the lab to explain it, but they're not explaining it the best terms, okay? They're just explaining it to the best of their abilities. You don't necessarily need to understand what they're talking about to go through the steps and learn how to configure an IDS. So, anyway. All right, so we have lots of different machines on here. I think we're just probably using SEM and SEM1 and Kali. So let's see how that goes. Let's go through, we're gonna browse through the IDS tool here. We've logged on to SEM. Let's use uh, Eskile here. Okay. And we'll log on with these uh, credentials. Username SEM. Password is going to be the normal lab password, PASSW0RD. We're going to hit OK. All 
All right, now we're logged on. Okay, we're gonna ch check here, SEM1, F1, or SEM, F1. And we're only gonna check that, and then we're gonna start S Guile. Okay, here we go. So here we have this connected to our local host. And we already have a number of alerts generated by, by this device. And we got possible event message, a Trojan, uh, possible SSH scan, couple Trojans. It's not what you want to see when you open up your IDS. Anyway. All right, let's take a look at our uh, Kali Linux machine. Log on to that root and password. Okay, we're going to do a ping on our Kali machine. I think that was 10.0.0.1. Ah, well we need a, a flag here. Ping 10.0. No, 10.1.0.1. 10.1.0.1 dash C10. Okay, and we're getting a ping there. And we're just pinging it 10 times here. That's what the C10, it's the count 10, okay? So all we're doing is we're telling it to ping 10 times. Okay, so that ping worked. All we did was the ping just to show, and then we're gonna see those pings here in real time. You can also, you can filter these, you know, this is basically like a spreadsheet. You can filter these however you like, okay? So we can, you know, filter these to see. What, you know, when these occurred or how often these, what times they occurred, what port numbers they were, destination IPs, all different or types of events. And we see these pings right here. We can open this uh, right here. These are just basically ICMP pings, okay? The count over here on the left, you see CNT. Count is 10, it means this event happened 10 times in a very short amount of time. Okay, now we can show the packet data by checking this box. And here we see the packets themselves, okay? And these are basic packets, these are ICMP packets. We can also do show rule to show the rule within the intrusion detection system that generated this alert. Now it wants us to record the rule SID. We're going to have to click down to find that. Okay. And we see we saw the SID just there. So that SID is going to be this. 2003068, that's going to be our rule. We can also uh, resize this whole thing if we like. All right, and we're going to record that there. There should be a spot to submit this, but there isn't. Okay, so now we're going to. Since we, you know, this is a basic alert, we can take a look at some of the other alerts that are on here. Like here's a Trojan that was downloaded. You know, if we uncheck this, we're not going to see any of this information here. So you probably want to have this checked as default. We can see where 
this occurred, what port this occurred on, and then we can see the event message. If you had a larger monitor, if this VM had a larger monitor, it'd be a little easier to navigate this. But you know that's kind of helpful right there. And we can even sort by the event messages themselves. Okay, now so a lot of these are gonna be different, but some of these are gonna be very similar. So they're gonna group them into similar uh, similar groups here. Or we can do date and time, ascending or descending for all of these. And these are all the dates. You see how the dates are a little off. You know, it has historic events already stored in from 2020. And then, you know, we have our 2023 event right here. Okay, so let's configure a rule. Uh, enough uh, messing around. Though I do invite you to mess, to play around with these labs if you have these labs. Um, go outside the boundaries of just what it tells you. The goal of the lab is to help you understand these, these concepts. Okay, so let's go ahead and configure SCAL to auto-categorize different events. We're going to disable a rule that alerts on ICMP matches. So on SEM1, which we're on right now, uh, we're on SEM1, right? Okay. We're going to go ahead and open, open the terminal. Okay, so you just right click anywhere on the desktop, open the terminal, then we're gonna run a command, super user do or sudo vim slash etc. So we're navigating to the etc. folder slash nsm slash pulled pork. Slash disable SID dot config period and then we're going to go ahead and hit enter it's going to ask us for the super user do password which is the default lab password and then it's going to give us a success here okay <laughs> we're going to hit Go. That navigates us to the end of the file and it puts us into insert mode. Okay. And we're going to type in 1 colon 2003068. Now that's the SID of the alert that we had identified previously for ICMP pings. Okay. We're going to hit escape, and then we're going to hit colon WQ to save and close the file. So essentially what we've done, we've edited this file, located, and we've edited disableSID.config, okay? We've entered one as the value for this ID, remember that ID corresponded to the SID of the ICMP ping uh, alert. Okay, here's the ICMP alert. That's the SID ping. All right. Actually, these are different. This is a different ping. This is a different ID. Slightly different. This is 6.8 and this is 6.6. I thought these were the same. Okay. Though I think this is still gonna work here. Okay, so so we modified that file and then we saved it, okay, with W quick to save and close the file. So we should be set there. 
All right, so let's go ahead and go back to our Kali machine and then ping this ping our uh, virtual machine again. 10.1.0.1 count 4 we're going to do this four times. 1 2 3 4 done. Then we're going to switch back to the sem. We're going to check our console. Now this is 6.6. Six. Okay, so we need to do this again. I think what's going on here is, if I change this, it uh, changes this too. Okay, so this is just reading off the script here. So I, I mistyped this. This was 6.8 I had in there before. It should be 6.6. Six. So if you mess this up, you know, don't worry, I messed it up too. <laughs> so we need to alter this file, but we need to modify the value to be 6.6, six, not 6.8. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go sudo vim. Actually, we can just hit up to access this file again. So go back to that terminal that you used before to modify the disable sid.config file. Hit enter. Okay. Then we're going to type go again. Uh, if you hit enter after go, it's not a huge deal. Um, you shouldn't, but try not to. If you do, it's not a, not a big deal. Then we're just going to type in 2003-066 or 1 colon 2003-066. We're going to hit escape and then we're going to hit colon WQ and then hit enter. Now that should be saved. Now we can go back to PT1 Cali and then we can ping or we could just do this, hit up, and I'm going to do a count of five this time. One, two, three, four, five. Now if we go back to our sem, we check, and we still have that. The count's still going up, so something's going on here. We're not really configuring this correctly. Oh, okay, this is, <laughs> okay, for some, whatever reason, I don't know, I misread this entirely. There needs to be a one here. It's 21030066. That's the ID here. So let's go back. You're getting a lot of, sometimes when you break a lab or you do something that's not correct, it kind of teaches you a little better than if you do it correctly the first time. So we're just going to say that that's what happened today. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and hit up to activate this command again. Now we should be pretty good at doing this. We're going to go ahead and uh, hit go. All go does is moves your cursor to the end of this file. Okay, so I can if I hit go, moves our cursor to the end of the file. Actually, I'm going to do that over again. Because uh, I'm in insert mode right now, so I'm just going to quit out of this. But if I'm here, if I just in, in put, if I've just gone into the file, I could just type go, moves my cursor down. You see how my cursor jumped. Then now I'm in insert mode. I can type in what I need to type in. Now we're gonna make sure to type this in correctly. Twenty one zero three zero six six. Okay. Then I'm gonna hit escape. It gets me out of insert mode. I'm not modifying the file anymore. I'm gonna do colon wq and hit enter. Now I've saved and closed the file. Now, when we ping, let's do up, and I'm gonna do a count of six this time. Well, let's make it seven, seven. Seven pings. We go back to our sem one. Now if we check, nope, it's still working. Okay, essentially what's going on here, this SID is changing every time. You see this? I thought I just mistyped it, but actually the SID is changing. So this is an example of, this lab's not really designed super well. Because if, if we, we're basically, we're, we're modifying the file correctly to block different SIDs. So how we're doing this is we're blocking it based off the SID. 
But the SID is constantly changing. Every time I do an ICMP ping, the SID changes. It was just 21030066. Now it's 21000366. Okay, so that's that's not something the lab's accounting for. So it's good we're doing this lab correctly. We're do, we're doing this lab because if you encounter this, it's almost like the lab's gaslighting you. <laughs> Okay, so essentially these rules really don't, um, oh my gosh. We didn't do pseudo rule update. We got to do pseudo rule update. That's what we're doing. So let's go back. I didn't do pseudo rule update. And the reason, okay, so we got to go back and change this up. One more time. We're going to go into this file, type in go. We're going to do the new SID which is gonna be 21,366, 21, okay? Three, six, six. All right, escape, WQ, now pseudo, rule update okay now it's running this correctly okay so now if we do this ping it should work ran our ping let's go back okay now the ping has been working correctly so yeah this has been changing each time but Joke's on me, I never ran the rule update, run pseudo rule update to apply the change. So because of that, we never did the uh, update. We never updated the rule. You know, we just changed the file. We didn't apply the file to the IDS. Okay. But by doing that multiple times, now you know how to update that rule pretty well. And you could do this for any one of these rules. Now, if you can update a rule by modifying the file using a, a terminal window like this, then you're set to modify rules on more advanced IDS or more user-friendly IDSs that have a graphical interface. A lot of these IDSs are gonna have a graphical interface where you can modify the rules, you can uh, change the rules in, you know, by clicking a few buttons, not by having to modify a text file. And we could do things like that with you know, most of these. But if you know how to modify rules in this old way or this uh, very technical way, then you're pretty good. You'll be set to modify an easier to configure IDS. Okay, so what? which of the following best describes the purpose of editing the ETC NSM pulled pork disable SID configuration file? Uh, and basically to disable connection logging based on a specific SID. or disable a rule that identifies ping packets based on the specific SID. Any ideas? Any ideas on which one you guys want to pick? Right. So we've disabled ICMP pings from, uh, from triggering the alerts, and that's based off that specific SID, which could change it on us because we never updated the rule itself. Okay, so very good. Now, once we've run this rule update, we've applied basically every rule that we put into this uh, pulled pork disabled SID or the disable SID not config file. Okay, wonderful. Okay, let's go ahead and, and do some pen testing or simulate pen testing. So we're gonna run some intrusive pen tests from PT1 Cali. And we're gonna run Nmap. And Nmap is gonna be your go-to as a pen, pen, a pen tester, you know, for a lot of uh, network scanning and network mapping. So we're gonna go ahead from any terminal, run Nmap, and then we're gonna target that machine, 10.1.0.2. We're actually targeting 10.1 to 0.2. Uh, let's see. It 
Shouldn't this be one? I think that's one. Let's try one. Because the virtual machine should have... No? Oh, we're... Jeez. You don't type run. Sorry. Just type nmap. nmap is a command for nmap. You just type nmap 10.1.0.2. So it's starting that map MS working correctly. Sometimes I get into autopilot and I just start reading the commands. But really this shouldn't say, it should say type nmap 10.1.0.2. I can see a lot of people getting confused with this because it's the same font too. But all you do, the command for nmap is nmap. And then we can add flags to that. Uh, so you would just do nmap 10.1.0.2. Now if it's 10.1.0.2, what is that? I think that might be DC1. Because it's not. Sem1 is 10.1.0. Now this is 10.1.0.1. Okay. Oh, okay. So we are pinging. Sem1 is 10.1.0. Let's take a look. I'm just running IF config uh, just to find the IP address here. Now let's see what MS1 is. Okay, so it's MS1. 10.1.0.2. That's MS1. So we're pinging MS1 from a PT Cali machine. It doesn't tell you that in the instructions. Okay, but as we know, based off our network diagram, uh, the SEM1 is monitoring the entire network. Okay, so we should be able to see this. So if we go to SGIL, we should see a new alert now. And here we go. Scan. Potential VNC scan. I hope it would be nice if we can expand this a little more. Let's expand this out to take a little bit. That's the rule. Source IP 192.168.2.192 to 10.1.0.2. So source IP is the Kali machine. Destination is MS1. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna command. We're gonna do this entire string of commands here. Make sure to. Try and type this correctly. I know you can't copy and paste the text like you would in the Windows machines. So hping3 with a flag uh, dash c of 1000, flag dash d of 120, a flag dash capital S dash w 64 dash p port 80. P80, double dash flood, double dash rand, dash source, source is 10.1.0.2, 10.1.0.2, okay, we're going to go ahead and hit enter, okay, so we're basically flooding. Uh, we're doing a flood attack, and we're going to set the, tor uh, the source address as uh, MS1, 10.1.0.2, okay? Now let's take a look at our, we'll let this go for a little while. We can hit Control-C to stop it, okay? So what type of attack is, are we doing here? Now, if we're doing a flood attack, okay, we're going to be targeting 
availability. So it's going to be a denial of service. Remember, a flood is designed to overload a system, overload a server, prevent that server from providing normal access. So let's go ahead and see what that alert looks like in our sim. Okay, and here you can see the sim's going a little nuts. Uh, <laughs> may have let that run a little too long. This is actually kind of fun with this thing. <laughs> That's a lot of alerts. Okay, all right, there we go. So all of these different alerts, So we, all of these are pings, and uh, or all of these are the result of that flood attack we did. And you can see all these different alerts that were generated here. We're using the HP ping 3 tool to do this. Okay. Now let's take a look at the rule. Spam house drop, list traffic inbound, uh, and this is basically due to this rule here. This isn't going to work, this link. This shouldn't be up. Maybe we can get this link up in Firefox. Let's take a look. What is that? Let's take a look at this link. Spamhouse.org slash drop slash drop dot lasso okay here's what that rule looks like okay and this one is basically the spam house project is a you know open source uh, repository for rules like this and basically these are pre-configured rules that you can implement into your IDS. And this is what that rule would actually look like. If we were to click on that link, we can't click on the link here. So I just open up a new window and type that URL in manually because this isn't connected to the internet. Okay, so this is, that rule list essentially identifies this as a type of uh, uh, flood attack. Okay. All right, which of the messages best describes the event message displayed in Esquire? All right, any thoughts here? ET drop, span house, drop messages, connection block messages, ping messages, H ping DDoS messages. Thank you, thank you, lab. Yeah, so as we said, the event message is ET drop span house drop list. It's being, the rule is being generated from that list uh, that I just showed you. So this list was basically uploaded or incorporated as part of the IDS. Okay. All right, wonderful. And if you want to explore you can go to you know you want to explore you know spam house and what what they're about you go to the spam house project spamhouse.org let me put a link and basically they create uh, they create lists they create alerts for different types of spam so that ping attack that we did would be recognized as spam okay they put out advisories for different types of spam they make block lists, uh, all sorts of all sorts of good resources, you know, for, for security professionals. So take a look at them. Okay. All right. Now we're going to attack the MS1 Windows Server. <laughs> so we're going to switch to MS1. We're going to go to Task Manager. You can just search for Task Manager. Go to Performance. Okay. And we're just going to look at our performance here, the Ethernet tab. You don't see any Ethernet traffic. You know, if we 
We can generate some traffic, I think. I wonder if this is configured in this lab. Okay, I'm just testing to see if this, sometimes they have these internal websites uh, set up for the labs. I wanna know if this is, this lab also has that. We're gonna open up PowerShell. Uh, make sure to right click, run over, uh, run as administrator when you open PowerShell. So we have PowerShell open, we're right Netstat. Okay, we don't see any active connections. Nothing's connecting to MS1. All right. And we do have some, you know, I, I attempted to access that email address, or not that email address, that URL on Windows Internet Explorer, and that's what these little uh, spikes are. All right, it wants us to organize the so task managers on top with network performance displayed. We'll just switch back and forth. Now let's go ahead and switch uh, back to PT1. We're going to hit up on the arrow key to re-enter re that, that attack. Let's go back to MS1 and take a look at what's going on. <laughs> That's a pretty drastic jump from zero to pretty much max. <laughs> <laughs> Usually you'll see a little more gradual jump, but this is just a straight line, straight up. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so we, we re-ran the attack. The attack's running right now, and, you know, MS1's going a little slow. It's having trouble keeping up. I <laughs> wonder why. You can see the responsiveness. I'm clicking on these to try and move them around. <laughs> so you can see the effects of the DDoS attack. Uh, it's working pretty well. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. Um, yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and stop that attack because, and so we can use our, remember control C stops any script you have running. So let's go back to MS1 and uh, take a look. Okay. Traffic's dying down now. Pretty good. All right, now let's try running the netstat again. We weren't able to run this during an attack, so we didn't see any active connections because the machine was bogged down. You could tell though that there were definitely connections here, okay? It's asked us to do that during the attack. We, we weren't able to do that. Okay, so now we see the task managers functioning as expected. You can see the attack right there listed pretty good now we can run netstat like we normally can no active connections okay now we can go back to our sem and take a look and see yep sem's going crazy popping off seeing all these different alerts that we have because we we ran this denial of service attack so pretty easily uh, configured there okay so we see all these different types of attacks there. All the attack from the the HPing three. Now this question that's interesting: Why are the source IP addresses all different in SGUI? If the attack originates from PT1 Cali at 192.168.2.192. Good question. Any any ideas? So we know that the PT1 Cali has that IP address, okay? That IP address on 192.168.2.192. If we go to PT1 Cali and we just run an IF config, we'll see that. Okay, 192.168.2.192. Just like when we ran the IF config on the SEM, we saw the IP address here. Okay, so why are the source IP addresses here from that H3 
H ping three attack uh, different? Good question. Any ideas on which one would be correct? Various source IP addresses are not participating in the attack. The H ping three utility randomizes and spoofs the source IP addresses based on the random source parameter. Now the PT1 Kali VM is taking control of the computers at those IP addresses. Computers at those IP addresses are pre-configured to participate in HPing 3 DDoS attacks for educational purposes. So the HPing 3 utility is very easily able to spoof IP addresses. And that's uh, pretty simple to do. Okay. So let's take a look at the commands we used here. HPing 3 count 1000. Uh, random source okay so we have random source as the source IP we can specify an IP source or we can hit random source like this with this double dash now that's what's going to determine or tell HPing 3 to generate random IP addresses as the sources and this is our target 10.1.0.2 so that's why if we look at our SEM we see all these different types of source IP addresses. And they're seemingly random because they are. They're absolutely random. So that's why that's correct. All right. Let's go ahead and do the comprehensive questions. Why was the Nmap scan identified as a threat by S Guile or S G U I L? Nmap followed a pattern for a well known scan. Nmap is identified as malware by S Guile. Nmap is designed to combat Nmap can attacks or SCAL is designed to combat NMAP attacks specifically, NMAP is a well-known DDoS attack tool. What do you guys think? This one? Not right. Yeah, it followed a pattern for a well-known scan, okay? And all we did with Nmap is we just did a basic, uh, a basic Nmap scan to begin with. Remember, we just did Nmap 10.1.0.2, okay? So that's the most common scan you could do. We didn't put any flags in there. We didn't have any altering parameters. We didn't make it a sneaky scan at all. We just did a regular scan. So it followed that pattern as a well-known scan, and the IDS was able to pick up on that. All right, why might it be useful to set a rule that ignores ICMP ping network traffic? ICMP and ping are essential network troubleshooting utilities. Active Directory relies on ICMP to communicate with client computers. ICMP packets carry essential network traffic, where ICMP and pings are used by client computers to discover DNS servers. Any thoughts? Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah, ICMP and ping. Remember, a lot of times these labs, we are just doing a basic ping or an ICMP ping. We're just using that to diagnose if a connection is successful. That's often used by systems administrators to just check that a, a network connection is working. So you might want to ignore that rule or just set it as low priority um, within your your sim it's not it I don't think it would necessarily hurt you can uh, set the priority level for that ICMP ping and you can just you know basically ignore it but if you have a large network you might want to consider disabling that entirely as a as an alert because there's nothing inherently malicious you can do with just an ICMP ping okay so great job Hope this was helpful, and if you have any questions, please you know, uh, leave a chat or info at cybercrafttraining.com. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.